So a very warm welcome, everybody, to this CNBC television event. We have a large audience in the room, as well as our panelists, and, of course, you, our global audience. And you are all very welcome here to our discussion on the future of financial markets. Let me introduce our panelists to you and set the tone for the next hour. IMF Managing Director Kristalina Gorgieva joins us. Very nice to have you with us here Great at this to be event. With you. Just as the IMF, of course, suggests that we might see a little bit of weaker growth for full year 2020. We will discuss that. U.S. Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin, who joins us fresh from a breakfast with the President. Good morning to you, and thank, thank you. you for joining Great us. And I, I guess it's idle sort of speculation, but it may be important. Was it a continental breakfast, an American <laughs> breakfast, or an English breakfast? We're, we're going to call it an American breakfast for a lot of reasons. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I think that's the best. English is the best. We haven't even got to you, Sajid Javid. So we'll, you, you just hold your fire. We'll be there in just a moment. Uh, UBS chairman of the board, Axel Weber, joins us. A particular insight, of course, as we all know, into the actions of central banks as a former central banker. Um, thank you so much for being Pleasure with us being on the panel. And let's talk about UK Chancellor Sajid Javid, who you've already heard from. Some reports that he wasn't going to make the panel because he was already headed down the mountain. Uh, we're pleased that those reports were untrue. We're also pleased that he managed to bust Boris's ban from being here in Davos. <laughs> so you are very welcome. Thank, Thank you, for you having very me. much for coming and drinking champagne with the billionaires <laughs> here at the, uh, the World Economic Forum. Uh, so, so let's kick off our conversation here. Um, Secretary, if I could just start with you, because you've just come out of a, an important breakfast, and I think there are a lot of issues on the table for financial markets that we'd like answers to. It's taken 22 months to get a phase one agreement with the People's Republic of China. We now have a deal. Is it possible to conclude phase two before the US elections take place? Well, let me first say it's, it's great to be back in Davos and it's great to have the president here really talking about what, what is the, the great economic performance of the U.S. economy and the great outlook that we have. Uh, the China deal, we couldn't be more pleased. Uh, this week we, we signed the phase one agreement. It is a very significant agreement, including issues on forced technology, transfer, agricultural structural issues, financial services, currencies, purchases. And we also concluded the U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement. So this was a great week for trade agreements. Um, as it relates to phase two, I would say uh, there's, no, there's no deadlines. So the first issue we're very focused on the next 30 days is implementing phase one. There's also, as part of this, a real implementation office uh, as part of enforcement. And we'll start on phase two. If we get that done before the election, great. If it takes longer, that's fine. So 22 months is not a, a relevant number in terms of targets and agendas. I think we dealt with a lot of the important issues in, in phase one and, and, and things that we've, we've never dealt with before. And I think that gives us a great advance into phase two. But whether we get it done or not, I just think the, the combination of phase one and the combination of the USMCA, and I know we're very much looking forward to a new trade agreement with the UK, that's uh, a big priority of ours for this year. Um, I was pleased to see that you said you do us and Europe at the same time. I was a little disappointed. I thought we'd go first. <laughs> they may be a little harder to deal with than we are anyway. But uh, a lot, lot of good things for 2020. And can you clarify for our audience just the position on tariffs? Because it appears that you are reluctant at this stage to relieve pressure on the Chinese with regard to tariffs. So tariffs continue up to a phase two agreement and beyond? There's no question that the president's tariffs have been a big incentive in all these trade agreements. So whether you like tariffs or you don't like tariffs, we wouldn't have these trade agreements without either actual tariffs or the threats of tariffs. The president has said if we get all of phase two done, he will remove the tariffs. We could easily have phase 2A, 2B, 2C. It doesn't need to be a big bang, and we'll take tariffs along the, off along the way. So they're, they're a big incentive uh, for the Chinese to continue to negotiate to conclude various additional parts of the agreement. Managing Director, the consequence of this uh, disagreement have been a reduction 
um, of over 11 percent worth of bilateral trade between the United States and China. But as we know, it's also had an impact on stalling global trade in some areas as well. How do you feel about the possibility or risk for the global economy that we have another decline in those trade relationships because they're negotiating? The two big boys in the room are fighting and the rest of the world takes the pain. It is uh, very good that uh, there is now truce and a pathway to peace. And it has been reflected in how the outlook for the world economy is presented today vis-a-vis -vis a couple of months ago. We are in a better place for three reasons. One is the signing of phase one, which has reduced by 0.3% what would have been a cost on the world economy. Two, and two is very important, the fact that central banks have been pursuing accommodative policy in a synchronized manner. We had 49 central banks cutting interest rates 71 times, and the result is half a percentage point boost to global growth for last year and for this year, for 2020. So last year, we ended up with 2.9% growth, would have been less than 2.5, which by the judgment of the IMF means recession. So we have avoided that. Uh, of course, central banks, many of them are running out of space, not the US, but many others are in a tougher place. That has helped. And three, what we see is finally bottoming out in trade and industrial output. Now, you started by saying the IMF is not so rosy about next year. Uh, this year, next year, true, we have reduced our forecast from 3.4% to 3.3%, but it is only because of India, the main reason for downgrade, and because of unrest in a couple of countries. The rest of the world looks better today than it did uh, in October. Let me come back to the central banks, because I think uh, we can spend a bit more time on that topic. But I just want to finish where we are on the trade story here. You have said in the past mm -hmm. that the effects of this trade dispute could last a generation. There could be broken supply chain impacts yes. going forward and a reshuffling of the way the yeah. world does its business. You seem to be edging back from that a little bit now. Is well, that because we are making progress? I think, I think uh, we do have a piece of good news. And um, uh, as the secretary said, uh, there is already initiation of phase two. I had uh, a meeting with uh, Vice Premier Liu He, who tells me in a very determined manner that China is engaging uh, on the implementation of phase one very seriously and, and on phase two very seriously. So this is a piece of good news. As I said, trade truce is not the same as trade peace. Trade peace is what we should be aiming for. We do have a better outlook on trade, and it is demonstrably uh, in the numbers of trade finally bottoming out. Let's remember, last year was a very sad year for trade. Uh, trade growth was 1.4%. Lower than, than economic, uh, that economic growth is uh, very unusual. Now we are seeing trade picking, picking up. Uh, is that good enough? Obviously not. Uh, if our projections for global growth are meager, because 3.3% this year, 34 next year, this is anemic uh, growth. Part of it because, is because these issues are not totally sorted out. Uh, we will be continuing to advocate for unleashing the power of trade because historically we know trade is good for growth, it is good for jobs, and it is good for the, the low-income people in all countries. You have um, characterised the risk as one of creating a digital Berlin Wall. 
that something coming from your background. Um, yeah. Secretary Mnuchin, do you recognize that as a potential outcome if you and the Chinese are unable to find a meeting of minds on issues like Huawei and IP theft and the future for the Internet? Um, no, I, I discard that. So, I mean, let me be clear. You know, words like trade, peace, trade, war, things like that, those to me are not the right words, in all due respect. To me, it's about free, fair, and balanced trade. So what the U.S. is one of the largest trading markets in the world. Uh, if we can get free and fair and balanced trade with China and our other partners, this is good for us, good for them. It's one of the single biggest opportunities for American workers, for American companies. There's a huge growing middle class in China, 400 million people. It'll be good for them and good for us. So what we're trying to do is break down barriers to trade, which do exist. And I think most people know the U.S. is the most open market for trade, the most open market for investment. We want to have those same opportunities around the world. And again, we look forward to very much with the U.K. I think uh, two big markets for goods and services. We're, we're looking forward to tremendous growth uh, in, in with the U.K. and the U.S. So it, it's not a Berlin Wall at all. It's we want other people to take down the Berlin Walls. I'll come back to you in just a moment, Managing Director. I know we're short of time, so I want to make sure everybody gets a chance to speak. Um, Chancellor, if I could bring you in. Um, obviously, uh, we've just heard from the President uh, directly. My, my colleague, Joe Kernan, has just interviewed him, and he said, quote, uh, the U.K. trade deal, we've already started negotiating. Can the UK actually si sign a deal and sew up a deal ahead of settling the ledger with the EU? Well, first of all, thank you very much for having me on your panel. Look, we are passionate believers in free trade. We, the UK has been for a long time. And I uh, agree very much with what Kristalina just said about you know, more free trade around the world is uh, uh, good for everyone, but especially for those on lower incomes. And we see more free trade as a way to lower consumer prices and get more growth and more jobs in the UK and those countries we partner with as well. And, and in terms of our sort of next steps on free trade, uh, of course, one of the, the, the big ones is uh, with our European friends and partners, uh, getting that new comprehensive you know, free trade agreement where the principles have been agreed, but there's still a lot of work to be done, and that's off to a good start. But also uh, with the US, as, as the Secretary has said, uh, the, the, the work, uh, we've already started uh, work, and we are working uh, uh, you know, closely together, but that is a huge priority uh, for us as well. I mean, having a free trade agreement between the you know, sixth largest economy in the world and the largest economy in the world is going to benefit you know, all our consumers in terms of jobs, prices. It's hugely important. Uh, so the timing was the question. Can it be done before you settle the account with the EU? I, I just spoke with the, the Vice President of Spain who tells me that she met you recently and uh, you talked optimistically about your time frame. Uh, most uh, senior politicians in the EU seem to think that you're living on another planet when it comes to getting a comprehensive deal wrapped up before the end of the year. Could you take that question and well, also In terms of a trade, our, our, the first, our first priority is, of course, the getting the agreement with the EU. Because as we now leave, we'll be leaving in nine days you know, with a deal, but of course still to do the trade agreement. And we have, yes, we've set a timetable. It's the end of this year, but it can absolutely be done. And I've had a number of discussions myself with my European colleagues, a number of them yesterday, uh, for example. And there is a strong belief on both sides it can be done. Both sides recognize, of course, uh, that it's a tight timetable. A lot needs to be uh, put together uh, in the time that we have. Uh, uh, but it, it can be done, and it can be done for both goods, where we want to see you know, free trade with zero tariffs, zero quotas, uh, but also on services. Um, Axel Weber, could you give us a business perspective here? Um, how well received was phase one by the banking and the financial community? What impact already are you seeing in terms of the unleashing of animal spirits to take advantage of a Trump bump or a Boris bump, as it's so been right. described? Well, I think a phase one deal was a welcome break for the market. It's not a breakthrough, because phase two is going to be more important. So in a way, what, you, what we look at is basically what has been the impact of what is in the pipeline. 
And we expect a bit of an air pocket for U.S. growth in the first half of the year, largely because if you look at September tariffed imports, they're down 30 percent. Uh, there is a fading stimulus from, you know, the very welcome tax policies that we've seen uh, implemented by the Trump administration. The Fed has reacted to the disconnect between the policymakers and the market, so to say, and adjusted to what the markets have expected. Uh, the Fed's on standby rather than on hold, which is a subtle but important difference. And so the central banks have been coming to the rescue uh, almost over every of the past downturns, including some financial market corrections where the central banks were nervous about financial stability issues, but actually there wasn't a real threat for the underlying economy. So where do we stand? I think this really, uh, the whole trade universe has been renegotiated. And for me, what is important is that we don't lose the benefits of uh, fair trade around the globe, that if we dial back global exchange of goods and services, you know, which was a major force behind the, really the, the surge of growth over the last 10, 20 years, we're going to see some headwinds that will be more structural and long term. So I think everyone is knowledgeable of that. In terms of the agreement EU uh, versus European Union, look, it's hardly a surprise after three years that the UK is leaving. This is not an issue where time is helpful. Actually, time pressure is helpful. And so I think keeping the time pressure on to get a deal is going to be important. In, in the autumn, you, you talked about there being an investor strike because of the combined issues of trade and Brexit. Is that strike over? I think for the UK, there's a lot of expectation that now the new government has the majority it needs, so whatever it negotiates in Brussels, it can get done at home, which was a big concern before. Direction is also clear in that, you know, markets always suffer and uh, have a hard time when direction is unclear and people are taking directional bets. This is much clearer. This is gradual. And I think the UK will get a new agreement with the European Union, but it's not going to be a status quo preserving agreement. It's a phase out agreement. And for phase out, you know, one option is to phase it out in stages. And that's a likely option that you're going to take. You not move everything to the new world on the same point in time. And so I'm very optimistic that because it's in the interest of both parties to come to a conclusion like it was for the US deal, that we will see a deal done. It might not really tick all the boxes for everyone, but it's largely reassured the market. And some of the investor strike for the UK, in my view, where people waited for the ultimate resolution, we're seeing that disappear. We're seeing investment being made in the UK. People are coming off the sideline, people are putting money at work again, and actually that's going to be very good for the UK economy. Chancellor, briefly. I'm just going to add to that. We've seen a huge boost in investor confidence in the last few weeks because of the UK election result, and that result meant a removal of what you might call a double whammy of risk. There was the risk of a, a effectively a Marxist agenda for government. That was the proposal from uh, the Labour Party in the UK, probably the most anti-business sort of manifesto for government that's been seen in modern times. Mm -hmm. And that would have been a disaster for the British economy and disaster for working people in the UK. And yeah. that has been removed and, and that's been uh, a welcome boost for business. But, but, but also I... the certainty around uh, Brexit, no, the knowledge that with our majority, mm -hmm. the biggest majority since Tony Blair's time, it means this political stability, which means economic stability so the decisions we make on brexit that we uh, the uh, negotiations we do with our European friends they can be certain that they will put into European law quickly but you've you've said that brexit won't be a boost for all businesses some businesses may not benefit you've said that and also the alignment of uh, regulations and rules that the UK seems to insist on departing from. You've also implied that not everybody will benefit from that. So it's not a universal win, is well, it, for British well, business? What I've said is that you know, Brexit will be a change. You know, we've had this relationship with the EU, you know, a lot of economic integration for over 40 years, and of course, as we leave, there's bound to be change. But we've also been clear that there's no point in leaving the EU and then sticking with all its rules and regulations forever. We're leaving the EU, which means we're leaving its single market, we're leaving its customs union. That does mean we will not be a rule taker, but at the same time, it's really important that, uh, that it's understood that we are and will be one of the most pro-business governments the UK has ever seen, 
a, a government that believes passionately in the importance of business to generate the wealth that we need to pay for public services. That means low taxes, your sensible regulation, free trade agreements, not just with the UK, but with the US and many others. And mm. that's going to be, in the long term, that'll be a major boost to the UK economy. Secretary, if I can bring you back in here, uh, one area I think where there is some disagreement, and let's see how um, this gets resolved. 22 months to do a trade deal with the Chinese a conversation between President Trump and President Macron to get a volte face on the French introduction of a digital tax. The UK says it's going to plough ahead with its own plan in April. Can they get a trade deal with you if they insist on introducing a digital tax in April? We'll, uh, we'll, we'll be having some private conversations about that <laughs> that we don't need to have on, on TV. No, please do. Please but, do. Uh, we'll, 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 we've, I've made some comments on this already, and uh, we'll be having some private conversations. And I'm sure the president and Boris will be speaking on it as well uh, as the president did with, uh, with Macron. But, but this is a principled issue for you and for the American government, it seems. You just don't want foreign governments and countries imposing taxes on your digital industry willy-nilly. No, that's... Well, will, the willy-nilly is the important part. I think we've been pretty clear that we think that the digital tax is discriminatory in nature. There's an OECD process that we're participating in. International tax issues are very complicated. They take long times to look at. And, uh, you know, if, uh, if people want to just arbitrarily put taxes on, uh, on our digital companies, we'll consider arbitrarily putting taxes on car companies. So uh, I take away from that that if the tax is imposed in April, UK industry can expect some reciprocal tariffs. Is that a fair assessment? I, 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 we're we're going to have some private conversations. I'm sure this will be worked out, if not at but, our but, level, between the Prime Minister and the President, who have an excellent relationship. But there's so, a very clear threat there, given what you just said about the European auto industry. Uh, again, I want to just be clear. I think this is an important issue that we'll deal with. But going back to, let me just say, the more important stuff, let's not get sidetracked on... Well, this is uh, important on, for the markets. They will be worried I, about I, this. I don't think the markets are worried about this. I think the markets are, are very focused on two gigantic trade deals that the U.S. just did. Mm. A, again, I think phase one is very, very important to the U.S. and to China. I think the USMCA is very important. And, and again, getting this trading relationship with the UK will be fabulous for us and for them. And, uh, you know, we've, we're, we're, we will also be having trade conversations with the EU. Those started yesterday mm. in, in a bilat. That's going to be a focus of this year as well. So there's, there's still a lot to do on the trade front. And by the way, I think, I think we're going to see on the US economy very positive impacts of this in, in 2020. Just for a moment, it's always interesting to bring in our Davos audience here. So let me just do this for a moment. Um, if I could just, I think you're all very well aware of the issues on the table. If I could just get a hand vote on a universal digital tax, does the room think it is a good idea for many of these American technology companies to pay a digital tax? Please put your hand up if you agree with that premise. OK. Um, I that's would say clearly that's clearly a minority a of the room. I okay, agree. Just to be clear. I agree. I was worried that you stacked the room, but I think that was a very fair vote. I, the super majority of people agree with us. I, I think you've got them worried. They, all this talk about taking people Thank away you. for a little conversation in other places has got them a bit nervous. Put your hand up, then, if you don't think it's a good idea to see the imposition of this tax. Let's see how this one goes. I'm watching. <laughs> um, I think you may have just carried it just Thank slightly, you. but I wouldn't say there was a majority in the room for one way or the other. Um, <laughs> Managing Director, let me come back to you on this, because you have um, really put a stake in the ground on this issue of taxes being paid properly in the appropriate circumstances. Share with us your view here. Is it ultimately necessary for there to be a digital tax universally rolled out with the support and the involvement of the OECD. Before I get there, just to say to the secretary that this is what happens when you have a woman on a panel. We talk about peace. Uh, now to... 
to, to go to your tax, to, to, your, to the tax issue. Uh, I, uh, I agree with the Secretary that there is a process on the way that is an encouraging process on the question of uh, a digital tax. And it is, uh, I think, much better for businesses to have predictability that what is going to be in place is going to be respected uh, by everybody. Uh, we do believe that uh, having revenue mobilization on an appropriate scale in countries is important. So countries can invest in their people, they can invest in a critical infrastructure. And that what we are seeing in, in 2019 as an outburst of protests, we should not neglect, we should pay attention to that. We need structural reforms and yet reform-minded governments find themselves in a tough spot. So thinking of a inclusive growth, one that benefits as many people, actually uh, President Trump yesterday talked about the significance of wages going up for uh, blue collar workers. We have to think of an inclusive economy that carries forward competitiveness allows businesses to flourish. I am very concerned as somebody who has spent most of my life on the other side of the iron curtain in a non-market economy, when I hear people getting very enthusiastic about something that seems to be very much like a non-market economy to reduce this anxiety in societies that comes for the very rapid technological change that is displacing workers, that is related to the need to upskill for a different economy of tomorrow. Governments do have to have the revenues so they can create a level playing field for everyone. And uh, obviously, if the digital industry is one that is picking up most rapidly, mm. it has to be seen as a source of this equalizer in mm. society. But do it properly. Do it so it is done within uh, the uh, uh, multilateral context, wow. rather than countries uh, popping up with taxation okay. here, there, and everywhere. Uh, uh, Chancellor, that comes back to you then. So the managing director here is saying countries shouldn't be popping out their own taxes. Um, but the UK does seem set upon this April introduction of a digital tax. Could you perhaps comment on what you've heard? Um, the secretary doesn't like the idea. The managing director doesn't like the idea. Are you going to rethink? Do we get a U-turn? Well, well, if I may, just first, it's just worth taking a sort of step back on this, is that you know, technological change has been you know, huge and we welcome it and it's great for consumers, it's great for growth and stuff, and we embrace innovation. Uh, but I think everyone agrees that the pace of change in the last 10, 10, 20 years certainly has been unprecedented. And there has been, therefore, a growing sort of disconnect between where customers are based for these businesses and where the profits are generated. And you know, with more, let's say, traditional businesses in the past, the sort of the countries came together, there was an international treaty and understanding on corporation tax or other profits taxes, mm. and this does require an international solution. And that is something I think we all agree on, and that is why we are all part, the US, the UK, France, Germany, all, all, all uh, you know, the big economies are part of a discussion led by the OECD, as it should be, to try and come to an international agreement. And we're all part of that. So we all agree on that and I think we all agree that something needs to happen and that there should be it should be done in an international way and so that's what we're most interested in and this year could be that year of change when we you know th there's been a lot of work already being done on the sort of so-called sort of uh, pillar one pillar two of uh, what this could look like uh, there's of course not agreement yet but this could be the year of change and since we all agree I think we should all focus on that and reach an agreement this year so we can get on with it and could you answer the question <laughs> oh, God, I thought I was going to go with that. Um, no. there would be, there would are be you a going to do a U-turn? <laughs> are, are you going to unilaterally we, impose digital taxes in April? We plan to go ahead with our digital services tax in mm. April. 
and uh, it's important, as we said at the time, when we first uh, introduced it to Parliament and legislated for it, it is a proportionate tax, and it is a tax uh, that is deliberately designed as a temporary tax. So it will fall away once there is an international solution. Thank you. Um, Secretary, just to go, I just want to run a, a line under this trade conversation. So you've initiated the conversation now with the Europeans, and you're making good progress. A positive start in the early talks. Uh, absolutely. But I, I do want to just make one other comment on international tax, because there's a lot of focus on this. There should be as much focus on what we're calling Pillar 2, which there is an agreement on. Pillar 2 is a, a minimum tax, and this is actually very similar to what the U.S. adopted, our guilty tax in a minimum tax. And, and I think that's very important, because when you talk about revenues, I mean, the big issue is the chase to the bottom. Uh, yep. This has been the case in, in many places in Europe, where you have countries fighting against each other on lowering taxes. So this is a very big issue, having a global agreement that kind of there won't be a race to the bottom on taxes is, is a much bigger issue. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I would say on that we're hearing from multilaterals, and I'm sure our friends in the UK are also, is mm -hmm. people want tax certainty. Mm -hmm. Right now, we have tremendous issues on kind of not having global tax certainty. And both these things will be terrific for global growth yeah. and for revenues. Um, we constantly hear here uh, European officials saying Germany and the Netherlands must use their fiscal headroom to spend more, to stimulate growth in the Eurozone. You in America cut taxes to stimulate economic activity. Are we ever going to get out of first gear in Europe if we don't start allowing people to keep the money in their own pocket so they can spend it themselves? rather than trying to persuade governments to build bridges and roads to employ people? I think if Europe would follow uh, the President Trump's economic plan, which has been tax cuts, regulatory relief, and, and open and fair balanced trade, you'd see growth picking up significantly. We've had conversations with our German friends. They do have a significant surplus. I think, as you know, the president feels very strongly they should be paying their fair share of NATO and military expense. We have U.S. troops there defending them. Uh, we should make sure that energy security throughout Europe is something that's very important. And I think for the benefit of the rest of Europe, where they have fiscal room to increase spending, they should do that. I think you'd see growth pick up in Europe and, and as, as a result of that. I, I'm, I'm sort of loath to put fetish and German into the same sentence, but the CDU have admitted, Axel Weber, that Germany practically has a fetish when it comes to the black zero, as it's so called. Is it time for Germany to step up? Well, look, there's, uh, uh, there's a balanced budget rule, uh, like there is in Switzerland, there is a debt break for a normal fiscal situation. Now, there is nothing in any constitutional uh, form that I've seen in Germany that in a weak economic environment prevents Germany to use the fiscal room to maneuver to stabilize its own economy. And if that's to the benefit of Germany, it's to the benefit of the Eurozone. So I think this is not the issue of an interpretation of sort of a black zero being sort of the, you know, the northern star of fiscal policy in Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a few countries in Europe that have room to maneuver, and I think for the benefit of their citizens, they should use that. I think the issue of tax cuts versus expenditure increases is very clearly one that I would opt for as the first best choice in Germany. I think many Germans know better than the government what to do with their money. We should give them a chance to do that. And probably the first choice will not be to put railway infrastructure and uh, a new fleet of cars on the street. So uh, I think the, there is room to maneuver. The problem I see when you look at fiscal and monetary policy is that actually monetary policy over recent years is pretty maxed out. Fiscal policy, if you look at Europe, kind of many of the countries, except Germany and the Netherlands, are sort of quarreling with the constitutional hurdles of sort of 3% deficits and not going much further, even though there is room to maneuver if there is a, a severe situation. And the real thing is we need to move to long-term investments that basically provide a better economy of the future, whether it's digital economy, whether it is traffic infrastructure. And so now in Europe, like in the US for the next administration, the issue is not going to be fiscal or monetary policy, because there have been changes. The issue is going to be infrastructure, and in particular, making our countries ready for the next 
digital turn of the corner. And that's where most of the European countries are there. Just a word on, on, the, on the digital tax. Look, all taxes that are levied on a single industry are distortionary. As a global institution that basically uh, looks at level playing fields everywhere, any distortionary tax is bad for global activity, whether it's levied on a single industry or levied in a single jurisdiction. And so we think that if that were the case, that we move to a global level of taxes that's a minimum tax, there should be a process, as the Secretary said, around the OECD, which is the normal procedure of coming to an agreement. And when that agreement is reached, I think the industry would adapt to whatever that level of minimum taxes is that is said. Uh, financial industry is also a digital service provider. And there are many questions that come up. Does this simply apply to technology companies? Or does it apply to technological services that financial institutions are offering? So I think we need some clarity before we throw a stone in the water and see what the ripples and the waves do uh, to the environment. Um, I feel like a broken record on this question, but um, the IIF latest report has us at, what, 322% uh, global debt to GDP, uh, and yet both the ECB and the Federal Reserve pursued easier monetary policy and pivoted effectively through 2019. Was that the right thing to do? I know President Trump yesterday was talking about how the Fed maybe isn't even going far enough at this stage, but was it the right thing to do? Because we continue to borrow growth from the future by stoking this debt. Well, so I think what the Federal Reserve did, and to some degree the ECB, is they're reacting to a weak spot in the economy. And I think when you look back more than a year ago, the Fed was still on a path of tightening rates, and that was somewhat at uh, sort of a disconnect between where markets expected the economy to go. Last year, the mood here in Davos was very negative around the global economy. I wasn't as negative last year because I think the market had run ahead a bit of himself, but. You know, look, uh, I think central banks will always be data dependent, and if the economy weakens, they will use their tools. There is then the question, once you've exerted your standard tool set, and for the Federal Reserve close to zero, what other tools can you have? And I think that the, the difference we have is the U.S. economy and its capital markets have very little tendency to allow for negative interest rates not to be a major threat to financial stability. So the tool set that you can use in a bank-based systems where negative rates are basically a form of subsidized credit mm -hmm. or a capital market-based system where you have break the box and other uh, f uh, phenomena in, in money market funds will be quite different. The Fed will be much more cautious than European central banks to use negative rates. So there is a natural tendency for them to move to move to more quantitative easing type of policies. Mm -hmm. But look, the central banks have done their job. Uh, we shouldn't expect too much of them. The central banks will not be able to come to the full rescue if global growth were to falter. But that's not the hypothesis that we're working on. OK, everybody wants to go on this, I think. So, uh, Chancellor, let's bring you in first. Yeah, no, just um, quickly. First of all, low taxes are good. We passionately believe in that. It's not just economically right. I think it's morally right uh, as well. We've dramatically cut income taxes over the last decade. We've cut corporation tax to 19%, the joint lowest in the... G20. And uh, so that's our sort of general uh, The election's direction. over, by the way. You won. Yeah. But this is, it's a, uh, we've won, and that's great. But it's important that uh, the message is out there that Britain will remain this uh, low tax, business friendly uh, country because we won the election and the other side didn't. Uh, but I just want to turn to something that uh, Axel said that on sort of uh, you know, the role of fiscal and uh, monetary policy. And that one thing we also sort of changed in the election through our manifesto is that we're changing our fiscal rules. And, uh, and, and I think it's, uh, it's responding to the, to, the, to the sort of economic climate that we're in. I think there's been a structural uh, change and governments need to respond to that. And uh, what we've said is that you know day-to-day -day spending should be sustainable, so it should be matched by taxes and remain in balance. But we're taking a very different approach uh, to capital investment, infrastructure investment, mm -hmm. where we've changed our rules. So essentially, you know, we can uh, invest up to 100 billion pounds more over the next five years. And, uh, and the reason I've done that is because when I, I look at the capital markets and look at where uh, the UK government can borrow, we can borrow for 30 years at almost, um, almost minus 2% in uh, negative in real terms. 
And, uh, and that is, for me, I think that is a, yeah, I believe rates will stay low for long. It's almost like a signal to the government to, to invest in the infrastructure, invest in future, whether it's road, it's rail, it's yes. broadband, it's R&D, and to uh, in boost the economic productivity. And, and that's exactly what we're doing. And I think Charles other countries should be thinking about this too. The UK has exhibited the weak, weakest growth in a decade. Um, there have been hints, I think, from the Monetary Policy Committee that we may go another cut in interest rates. Would you like to see even easier monetary conditions for the UK? Look, that's a decision for the Bank of England. But when you mention growth, what I would agree with you on is that the growth is too low. Uh, that said, the IMF's latest forecast from this week says that the UK this year will grow faster than France and Germany and Italy and Japan. So I think it's fair to say it's low amongst many advanced economies, with the US uh, doing it incredibly well. Uh, and we need to get up to sort of US levels of growth. We need to gradually pushing our growth rate up. It's much easier said than done. But because of the political and economic stability we have, the policies we have, I think that can be done. Um, I, I just want to go back to your question. Was it the right thing to do to cut rates? The answer is yes, but it cannot be the only thing to do. And others on the panel explained why. And we need to be watchful for potential negative consequences. Mm. One potential negative consequence is very high debt in some places where debt carrying capacity is low is already a problem and we see it in some of the uh, developing countries. If interest rates for some reason move up, there would be a lot of pain for many. But most importantly, we are seeing more risk taking appetite. Low interest rates mean that in search for yield, some are doing things that may turn into a problem. Not to get too worried now, but to be watchful now. Um, we've only got a few minutes left on the programme. I want to just bring us back to the World Economic Forum key theme. And I know many of you have um, personal agendas on this climate change issue. But I think probably most usefully as we wrap up, it's to come to you, um, Secretary Mnuchin. This agenda is dominating here. And many companies that we're speaking to are putting out their own carbon, neut carbon neutral or carbon negative plans for the next 10 to 20 years. As we've come into this, uh, BlackRock, of course, has talked about the liquidity risk of companies and countries not recognizing the threat from carbon emissions. Um, can I ask you, is the US government getting close to a point where it may change its overall attitude on the climate and it might sign up to the same ideas that I think others have expressed while they've been here? Well, let me just say, I think that there's a misinterpretation as to what, what our view is. And let me also say, all the conversations I've had or sit in public things have been dominated on the economic issues, not the climate issues. Uh, since yeah. Monday. But let me be clear. Are you dismissing the importance of No, that? I'm not dismissing it. What I'm saying is, uh, I, I'm, I'm making the comment, I don't think it's been as big a focus as perhaps you were implying. Do you but, think that's because Greta Thunberg has been here? Uh, it, it, but again, let me, let me just go to the substance for a second. The U.S. administration very clearly believes in clean air and clean water. And we have been very uh, focused on technology to have cleaner energy in the U.S. And without a lot of government intervention, our private industry has been moving in that direction. And there's no question, there are places around the world where environmental issues are significant. I think if you look at them just given the size, obviously China and India are, are both very important areas. The president was very clear. The reason why we got out of the Paris Agreement was we thought it was an unfair agreement to the U.S. So we very much support that countries should be doing things where there are environmental issues, particularly in, in, in the air and water. We're very proud of our record there. And, you know, as I've said, uh, when I was able to drive, I had a Tesla. Uh, I, I loved my electric car. But 
you know, what we don't focus on is, okay, well, what's the generation for that electricity? And then when we have all these batteries that we have to store, what do they do for the environment? So I think this is a very complicated issue. And again, I would just say from the U.S.'s standpoint, we support a clean environment. We just believe it should be done in, in, in a way that can also be pro-business and, and thoughtful. Thank you very much for the comments and unfortunately I don't have time to take this along the rest of the panel uh, but I know you've all written widely on this so you can be read elsewhere but I say thank you very much to all of you for being on our CNBC special here and thank you, thank you. those of you who are here in a hurry to get out of our room at the World Economic Forum and for those of you watching around the world thank you.